So Eric Moore, Senior Cloud uh, Solution Architect at Microsoft. I'm based in Indianapolis. I cover a five-state-ish uh, geo. Um, I'm part of the Azure Customer Success Unit. So uh, when customers are looking to uh, do things, I can help enable that um, by kind of providing best practices. I won't go deep into my background. You know, I worked at Microsoft, and before that, I did not. So um, all that other stuff is out there on LinkedIn. You can follow my whole history if you want. It's quite boring, um, but off we go. So uh, first thing we're going to dive into is some of what you see here, right? So infrastructure as code, what it is, what are the benefits? We'll talk a little bit about imperative versus declarative uh, syntax and language, source control and branching, and then everything underneath that is a demo. So um, we're going to be moving quick once we get to that point because there is a lot we're going to build in a relatively short amount of time. Okay, so infrastructure as code, what is it? Well, the whole idea um, is really tied pretty tightly to DevOps, and it's born from the idea that if we could treat our infrastructure environment the same way we could treat our development environment and our development code, we could gain the same benefits that those teams uh, were reaping for many years before we got to the point of IAC. So a lot of these benefits that you're seeing up here, this comes from the Puppet Lab State of DevOps uh, report that they've been running for many, many years, where they survey, you know, 60, 70,000 plus uh, people every year. Um, so what you're looking at in terms of the higher change rate success for production, mean time to restore service, that's related to DevOps, um, but it applies 100% to infrastructure as code because those are things that kind of fit together quite nicely um, in terms of going down that path and using IAC, right? If you start headed down the infrastructure as code path, you more than likely are gonna adopt an agile and DevOps approach uh, to, to handling that um, because it does marry um, really, really well together. Okay, imperative versus declarative. What is this, right? So imperative language is something we know as likely scripting, right? So if you script something, um, you know, it really is describing what we will do and how we will do it, right? So line by line, what you're looking at here is some Azure CLI commands where we're creating a database, we're setting some regions, we're adding, uh, you know, a connection string, we're doing all of these things, but they have to happen in a very specific order, right? This is the order they have to follow. A declarative um, syntax or um, you know, development language is really focused on describing what we want, the end state, the outcome. So as opposed to describing how I will do something and what I will do, I literally say, this is what I want, now go and build it for me. Um, I love to think of this as pasta. So my non-tech people that I, I deal with in my day-to-day -day life, uh, family, friends, et cetera, um, if they want to hear me talk about this, which nobody does. Um, this is a great way to explain it though, right? So if I said I want some pasta, the imperative approach would be this is what you need to do, right? Mix some flour, roll the dough, cut in the noodles, boil water. All of those steps have to happen in that specific order. If I do something different, it's really going to mess up the whole process. If I need to add something in, it becomes much harder to do and change as opposed to the declarative approach where I say I want pasta. I don't really care what you do to get that onto my plate and into my stomach, just do it, right? So the declarative approach is really what people think of when they think about infrastructure as code, um, because when we build these templates out, and we'll talk about some of the different um, types of templates you can use, um, but really this is what people think of. Now, which is easier, right? The imperative or declarative? It sure seemed easier to say, man, I just want pasta. Well, in this particular example, right, it's 114 lines, of code to deploy this kind of somewhat complicated environment with CLI. Uh, to do the same thing in a template, it's quite a bit longer, right? And that template is one that is pared down considerably. Uh, this environment, if you exported it from the Azure portal, it's like a thousand lines long uh, to do the same thing that you can do with just a, a handful of uh, commands in PowerShell or Python or whatever, right? So it is easier um, with an imperative uh, language, but up to a point, right? It's always easier until it's not. So point in case would be here, let's say that um, the database there in the middle, East US, I didn't want it in East US anymore. Now I want that database in East two. To do that with an imperative language, I can't just say, okay, give me East two, because what would happen is I would end up with four regions because I didn't tell it to specifically remove East. It had already defined that. Um, if I do that with uh, a declarative language, I just say, 
give me southeast, east, and west, and it does it. So if I had other regions to find, it's going to pull them out because it's going to give me exactly what I asked for. Okay, native versus agnostic approaches. So AWS has CloudFormation, um, Azure has ARM. So pros and cons uh, to this approach versus an agnostic approach. And again, there's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, very, very flexible and you can mix and match, right? There's nothing that says you have to use all of one thing and, and not part of another, right? So some of the benefits though are you get day one support. So if you're always on the cutting edge, bleeding edge, I want the latest and greatest services as they're being released by my cloud provider. Um, you're going to get that uh, with the native template support. You also get some additional things because they are integrated in with the backend cloud provider. Um, so you get very, very tight integration, things like cloud trail, Azure policy, all of these things work in conjunction with the templates that are being built inside of that um, cloud. Agnostic approach. I didn't even bother putting in anyone else except for HashiCorp and Terraform because they are really the de facto standard when we start talking about IAC, right? So everyone knows um, or thinks of HashiCorp and Terraform um, probably right out of the gate, right? Even, you know, people in Azure, you know, they Terraform, right? That's the way to go. Um, so Terraform is great for a lot of different reasons. It works across cloud, even works on-prem as long as there's a resource provider. Most of the common things are already there. VMware has a bunch of different resource providers. A lot of storage providers have resource providers. Lots of different ways to tap into that. So it's a great stepping stone in a hybrid environment, which most people are unless you're born in the cloud. Um, but in those hybrid environments, if I want to stair step into ad Agile and DevOps and I want to start adopting IAC, now I can do it with Terraform. You can't do that with anything that, you know, uh, AWS or Azure offers because those things only live in cloud. Um, it could be used to deploy across cloud with minor changes. It's not like I can take a template that was built for AWS and then, you know, take that same template, change a couple things, and now I can deploy the same thing in Azure. It's a little more work than that, but basically the same, right? So it is much easier. If you had one thing to learn, Terraform does make that quite simple. Um, we've done a lot with, with Terraform as well. We invest heavily with them. Um, it's integrated natively into Azure Cloud Shell, so you can do your Terraform and it plan, apply, all of that just natively in Azure, which is why I have my slide here of, you know, Azure and Microsoft Love, Terraform and HashiCorp. Uh, we're doing a lot of other things with them as well. So we have an image builder service that's built on Packer. Um, obviously a great company, great products. It's open source for the free one. So go ahead and download it and try it out. Um, they do have an enterprise version as well that gives you some additional uh, features and capabilities. So why infrastructure is code? Reproducible environments. You can do full automation with CI, CD. Everything is very trackable with Git. Um, language support, this is only a handful. Um, there's some other things out there like Pulumi, if you've ever heard of them, where you can actually do infrastructure as code with traditional languages like uh, JavaScript, TypeScript. Um, there's C-sharp support now. Um, and all your work is visible. This is very important. So as an infrastructure person, I'm an infrastructure person with an infrastructure background. A lot of times the work you were doing wasn't seen. So if you adopt this agile DevOps approach, everything you do is seen and tracked um, and visible. And don't sweat the small stuff, right? So a lot of times people really go, I want to do everything with templates. I'm going to just, I'm going to figure out how to do this with a template. And you're going to spend hours, days, weeks, months trying to figure out how to do something when it would have taken you a second to do it with a, a little script, right? So once we start building here, you're going to see how easy it is to layer things together. I can combine scripts with templates. It's all about that CI, CD pipeline. So don't sweat the small stuff. Do what's easy, fast, repeatable, and it's going to work. Okay, source control and branching. So again, thinking of infrastructure, most infrastructure people are familiar with uh, CMDB, so change management database. Think of uh, Git and um, you know other source control providers as that, right? So if I'm an infrastructure person, instead of having a change management database, you know, now I'm gonna leverage Git, do the same thing my developers do, um, but it really does make it uh, better. Right, so, but the CMDB, it's only as accurate as what's maintaining it, right? So the people that are updating that, whether or not they're putting the right changes in, maybe some things aren't even flowing into there, right? So I can make a change in my environment and not put it in the CMDB and no one knows about it unless something breaks and then they know. But if we adopt this Agile and DevOps methodology, if we do the right things in our CI CD pipeline, we can actually prevent the flow of those changes into production, right? So I can put steps in place that will make it impossible for somebody to work around what I have 
in terms of deploying into a production environment. I can deploy into dev, I can deploy into QA, but I can put locks and guardrails around production. You can't do that with the traditional uh, change management. Obviously, the other benefits of Git, right? Multiple groups at the same time, and again, making our work visible. Okay, traditional branching strategies. So release flow, Git flow, these are all, I would say, way too complicated for an infrastructure person. And what these are focused on are really solving different problems um, that come up in a traditional development environment, um, really not necessary for infrastructure as code. So the method that I like to do, uh, and I encourage people to try, and obviously you can do whatever you want. Don't put it that Eric said, this is how I have to do it, because I did not say that. Everyone heard that. You can do what you want, do what works for you. but a simple kind of strategy I like is an environmental branching strategy. So really I've got my dev side, which is where I'm doing my testing. I'm just playing around. If I want to take that change, I have a pre-prod or a QA environment. The reason we have this for infrastructure is infrastructure a lot of times is shared, right? So it's, it's not as easy as me just making a change and pushing something out and then putting it into a QA environment because I likely need to have controls there. Uh, because I could have something like a shared network or shared firewall or, or all these other infrastructure components that are expensive. So they tend to get leveraged by multiple teams. Um, so I'm going to have to have approvals in place across the board and we're going to build some of that today. So the way it would start is I develop a new feature or someone asks me to make a change. I go ahead and make that change. I commit it. I push it. Everything looks good. I'm going to then issue a PR, a pull request to have that change merged into my pre-prod environment where it's going to be more rigorously tested by people that will be using it. And then if that succeeds, the final step would be me just making another merge and issuing another PR uh, to bring that into prod. So this is a very simple flow for, um, again, someone that's new to development work where they're going to go in, they're going to make the change and that's it, right? Commit and push. I'm out. At that point, it's this pull request for the rest of the way to move that code from the step test or staging environment all the way through into production. All right, let's get going. Okay, so we are going to use VS Code and um, Azure DevOps for this. Azure DevOps, as I'm wearing my GitHub shirt, um, we'll point that out. So maybe next year when we do this, I'll be using GitHub Actions and uh, doing something a little different. We'll see. Um, so if you haven't been to Azure DevOps, it's dev.azure.com. It's basically free at this point. Um, there are some enterprise versions available where you get, you know, uh, some additional things like concurrent builds and everything. But um, even as a free home user, you get five users for free. Um, you get a certain number of hosted build hours for free every month. Um, I think it's doubled. I want to say it's around 1,800. It used to be 730 hours, but I want to say that they, they, they double that number. Anyway, for infrastructure as code, though, um, 730 build hours is more than enough for what you're doing. Um, I do already have my um, Indie Cloud environment um, set up, my project. So my project settings that we're seeing over here, this is where I can adjust certain things, right? So if I wanted to use uh, Azure boards, Kanban boards, I could bring those in, test plans, artifacts, I could just toggle that switch. Um, the other important thing to call out here is um, down here on the, the side uh, where we've got integrations. So service connections is the component where I can link my deploys to something external, right? So doing my things here, where am I gonna deploy to? So I've linked my Azure subscription here. Um, you do have the ability to bring in other things, right? So here's AWS for Terraform, um, you've got Bitbucket, I mean Jenkins, Jira, Maven, there's all these other integrations you can um, bring in to build these service connections for deployment. Okay, so to get started, I do have a repo that's out here. Um, you can use any repo you want. You don't have to use the Azure DevOps repo. When I set this project up, though, it was the easiest for me just to leverage this. I could have built a private Git repo or a public Git repo. It doesn't really matter. Um, but the first thing I need to do is clone this. So I would have options here for your traditional copy. Then I could do my Git clone and paste that in. I can also clone directly into an IDE of my choice that's up here. Um, I have already done that and brought that into my VS Code environment, so I don't need to clone this repo. Um, but the next thing I need to do, because I have my code over here, which is uh, an ARM template, and again, we're not dealing with ARM. This is more about the CI CD side. Um, but the first thing I need to do if I want to start building this out is build a pipeline. So we have two types of pipelines. We have uh, build pipelines and we have release pipelines. So CI being the build, and uh, CD being the release. 
So we're gonna start with new pipeline. It's gonna prompt me for some questions. So this is actually walking me through now our new YAML um, pipeline build. So I think this is a bit intimidating for um, infrastructure people, again, who are newer to this whole process. So uh, do note, we do have the classic editor still down here. So I'm gonna click on that. That's gonna give me a GUI. It's gonna make it a little easier for me. Um, I get to pick, again, my repo. Where does my code sit? In this case, it's here. So I'm just gonna say continue. Um, again, it's gonna say, hey, it's really pushing the YAML. Look, you can go back to YAML if you want. That's all right, we're gonna stay with the GUI. We'll do an empty job here. So now I've got basically nothing at this point. This is just a pipeline that does nothing. Um, it's telling me that there's a hosted agent that I can use. Um, I could also do uh, my own agents if I had a server or something I could install an Azure DevOps build agent in my data center. Um, we're gonna give this a name. So it's gonna be dev-arm-build, sounds good. We're also gonna set a variable in our pipeline here. So we're gonna call this variable environment because we're gonna end up cloning this a couple times. Uh, this is gonna make it easy so I don't have to go back in and change a bunch of things. I can just reference this variable in my pipeline. So now we're gonna give it a task. So um, I will name this agent. And so notice it is inheriting it. So this is the pool that it's coming from. This is my agent spec VS 2017. So these are just servers um, sitting in an Azure data center. Um, I can pick you know, Linux ones, Windows ones. We'll just go with the default for now, um, but I will name it Windows agent because we will do something later uh, where this will make a little more sense. And now I'm gonna add something. So I need a job for this to run. So it's gonna prompt me with a bunch of things. These are built-in modules. So if I was deploying to AWS, I would type AWS. You know, here's my Terraform stuff native here. Here's a marketplace, I can grab this, my AWS toolkit, S3 uploads, lots of different things out there. Um, but we are gonna use ARM. So I'm gonna do ARM, my Azure Resource Group Deployment. I'm gonna give it a name. So we're gonna say validate ARM template. We are going to pick my subscription. This is that service connection that I had previously set up called Development US. Um, within Azure, everything gets deployed to a resource group. So we're gonna give it a name. So how about cloud con dash. Now I'm gonna reference that variable. So the way variables are referenced um, inside of an Azure DevOps pipeline is with the dollar sign in the parens. And we'll do that. So cloudcon dash dev dash RG. I'll pick my Azure region, we'll do East US, that sounds good. Okay, now it's gonna get into some questions about what do I wanna do, right? So I wanna do an ARM deployment. It's saying, okay, let's use a linked artifact. What's the template I wanna use? So I'm gonna to go to my repo and I have my ARM templates and here's my deployment template. So that's the one I want. And I also have the option with this plugin to look at my template parameters. So I'm gonna be able to override some of these things as part of the pipeline. So I'm seeing here, I got data classification as an option. These are just tags I've defined. Um, I've got environment as an option. It can be one of these names. Um, nothing else would work. I'll just say, okay. Um, I don't wanna override all these, right? My tags look fine. My uh, data classification, I'll choose not sensitive. I will put that in quotes though, just to be safe. Um, CloudCon for the purpose, that looks fine. But environment, we are gonna leverage a variable once again. My environment in this case is dev. Um, here's my deployment mode. So we support a couple different deployment options in Azure incremental, um, which is the default complete, which uh, will basically get rid of everything in a resource group unless it's defined in a template and then validate. So validate only is what we want for this step because we're gonna simulate a build release process. This is one of the things that's different with infrastructure as code. There's nothing to compile, right? So I don't have compilable code. Um, so doing unit testing, I mean, there's some things you could do with Pester and um, Terraform has some options, ARM has some what if capabilities, um, but really validate mode is what we'll do. It'll push it up uh, into the portal. It'll check for JSON syntax. It'll also check for some other things as well. Um, so like as an example, we're deploying a storage account today that storage account has to be in a certain name format. So it will validate that the name I pass in um, is uh, actually a valid name. So this looks good as far as I can tell. Looks pretty good to me. Um, and then the next thing we're gonna do is we are gonna do a publish step. So we're gonna publish an artifact from here into our release pipeline. So we'll just say publish artifact templates, give it a name. Um, now it's going to ask for path to publish. What do I want to publish? And in this case, I want to publish the thing that we're deploying. So let's just do that deployment one looks fine. 
and we'll give it a name. So again, variable. We'll say environment dash, I don't know, arm dash templates. That looks good. Okay. So we'll just go ahead and run this now. So we'll save in queue. So this is going to kick this off. So it's going to take the template that's already out there, the storage template that I have open on the right, and it's going to push it up and validate it. And hopefully if we did everything, that's going to work. So right now what you're seeing is it's going out and it's finding us um, an agent uh, within the pool. So again, this is a hosted build agent um, in Azure. So it's going to go out and just find one. I don't have to worry about running this from somewhere. It's going to push the template up in validate mode, and then it's going to publish an artifact out there to be consumed. That artifact, um, you'll see, we'll, we'll pick that up as part of our release pipeline here in just a second. So there it goes. This template validation should work relatively quickly. It did publish the artifact. So at this point, we're basically done. So now let's work on our release pipeline. So new pipeline. We'll go with an empty job. We'll give it a name. We'll call this one deploy to Azure. That sounds good. We'll keep this naming format. So dev dash arm dash release. Okay, that looks good. Variables, don't want to forget that. Environment, if I can type it right. And this is dev again, that looks good. Okay, so now if we look at our uh, pipeline, we haven't done anything yet. Um, we're gonna add an artifact though. So here, what type of artifact do we want? We want to build artifact that's coming off of our build pipeline, which there it is. We'll take the latest version of that artifact, which is what we want. Uh, then we're going to go in here and we're going to add a job. So same thing, right? So this is the hosted build agent. It's going to be the exact same job. And the only thing we're going to change this time is going to be the uh, deployment model. It won't be incremental uh, or it won't be validate. We're going to do incremental. We're actually going to do the deployment. Our template, give it a good name. Pick my subscription to deploy to. Same thing here, cloudcon dash environment, environment dash RG. That looks good. Make sure there's no typos. Looks good. East US, not East Asia. So the different thing here, now we're not going to pull from the repo, right? So it's going to say, where, where does this template live? And notice we're going to uh, work off our build artifact this time. So this is what's being published, just the folder um, that I told it to. So we'll say, okay, that's the one we want. Um, and then same thing, I've got parameters here. So same ones, I can override, I can set them again, which we will. So we'll get rid of this. Not sensitive, this looks good. Same thing here. Okay, and then now the deployment mode will be incremental. The only other thing um, that we'll, we're gonna change here is this. So this artifact directory, we also want to use a variable name for because it will change based on where it's coming from. Environment and environment because we're gonna have a QA and a prod pipeline also. Okay, this looks good. As long as I didn't forget any steps, let's say save, looks good. All right, so a couple things. Um, we built this stuff out, but we don't have any automatic triggers at this point. So nothing is going to kick off these pipelines for us. So we can set automatic triggers, uh, which we will do, but uh, keep in mind right now, this is all manual at this stage. So if I wanted to run this, I could just create a release, which I will. So let's say create, off it goes. This is gonna validate for me um, that what we did actually worked. So it's picking up that validated template off the prior build step. Um, quote unquote build, right? Because it's not compilable. Um, and now we're waiting in queue for, um, you know, a hosted Azure DevOps agent. Um, that's one of the things uh, that you would get with like the enterprise version. You could do concurrent, multiple concurrent um, hosted agents, which is rarely an issue for me. Sometimes uh, I wish that I could run more than one job at a time, but it's really uh, not that big of a deal um, in my environments. So off it goes. It's going to initialize these tasks. It's going to download the artifact and then it should just deploy the exact same way that we did, which off it goes now. So deployment in progress. So in my Azure portal, 
Um, this is my dev resource group because it is naming it based on what I told it with that environmental variable. Um, I already have the storage account out here. We're going to modify a few things. We're going to modify some tags and other things just for the sake of uh, speeding up the deployment um, due to the short window that we have. Um, I can track the deployments here. So here I can see that this is the latest 326. That looks accurate. So it is pushing this template up right now. And it'll take it a few seconds here uh, to go. Um, but when we're done, uh, we'll have a storage account with some tags that are defined. Um, and then we should have a couple other things set as well. Um, one of them being this secure transfer required disabled. And you'll see why this is important um, momentarily. Okay, so that looks like it's going uh, just fine. So the next step we need to do now is uh, work on building our QA environment because we haven't done anything with protection at this point. So I can check my code in anywhere, which is bad, right? So I should not be able to check code directly into production, directly into my, my master branch. That's trouble because that means I'm messing with uh, prod and that should not be the case. So let's go back to our pipeline and now we're gonna start cloning some things. So we've got our dev arm build look good. So let's just clone this pipeline. And we're gonna call this one, of course, QA. That's our next step, QA arm build. We'll go to our variables. Step one, always do that, QA. Okay, now this would be good to go as is. Everything is set with the variable, so it's gonna generate a QA artifact, it's gonna generate uh, a QA build. Um, but there's more we can do as part of this build step, right? So let's add something else. So I'm going to do AZSK, which is, is an open source tool that Microsoft provides. There's other tools like this out there um, that will scan my templates for security issues. And this would be something that, you know, I would likely want to do. Um, so what do I want to scan? In this case, I'll just scan this deployment folder. I could scan the whole repo. I can recurse um, as an option. Lots of things I can do here. Um, I probably want this to be my first step. If there's any InfoSec people out there, you would say, why wouldn't we do this in the dev step? And the answer is you would, but it wouldn't have been as cool unless I did it in the second step, because now the QA pipeline is actually doing something different. But realistically, you would have this everywhere. Um, so let's just go ahead and save it again, and I can save and queue it. Um, if I save and queue it, um, I actually know what is going to happen. Um, oh, we didn't set something here. It's chirping. Let's see. Uh, what did I miss? I don't think I missed anything. Let's try it again. Let's save it. Save it first, then we'll queue it. Could have been a transient error. Let's see. Maybe it was. I think it was. Okay. So off that goes, and this is going to fail. Um, I already know this is going to fail because uh, that setting I mentioned of not having uh, secure transfer enabled on the storage account is a big no-no. So we don't want to allow HTTP. We want this to be set to HTTPS only. Um, so when this fails, we're going to have something to actually go out and fix. So as this runs, we're going to see it hit this scan for template security and this build step is going to bomb out on us. So while that goes, we're going to go into our repos. Um, so we have no branches right now. We only have our master branch. We are going to create a new branch though, based on master and we'll call it QA. That's really the only other branch that we need. Uh, feature branches that we create, um, you know, we're gonna leverage uh, just the traditional Git process and check out a new branch that I'm working on and those will be ephemeral. They're gonna go away when they get merged into the, uh, the other branches. So now I'm gonna set a branch policy because we do have the ability now to set a build validation policy. So the way this works is I'm gonna say that nothing can get checked in to this QA branch until it passes this successful build step, right? So the only way that can happen is with a PR, right? So I have to issue a pull request. I'm not allowed to just commit my code directly into this branch. So I'll say save on that. And there's other things you can do, and we are going to do something different um, for our prod one. Um, but let's go back and look at our pipelines now. So this one is still going, manually triggered. Let's see where we're at, scanning the template. And I do see one failed um, item down there. It went kind of quick. There's an Excel file that gets generated with this tool. You can download it, tells you um, exactly what you need to remediate and why you need to remediate it. But um, we already knew this was coming. So what I'll do now as a developer is I'm going to come over to my console. I'm going to do a git checkout dash branch. We'll say, I don't know, fix dash security, something like that. Okay, now I'm in my security branch. I'm going to set this to true. That looks good. I'm going to go ahead and save that. 
So again, for me as an infrastructure person, this is my process. This is what I'm doing, my security, you know, added HTTPS, I'm gonna commit and I'm gonna push. Now, at this point, nothing is automated, right? We talked about how we don't have any automated CI CD set up yet. Um, so let's go ahead and build that after we build our release pipeline uh, for QA. So we've duplicated our, our build pipeline. We're gonna do the same thing now for our release. So we're gonna go here, we're gonna go into this and we are going to clone, same deal. We're gonna change the name, QA arm release. A um, Couple other options that we're gonna to have to change here. So number one, um, always the variable that we're referencing, so that's good. Um, but now we have this artifact. So notice it's still referencing the dev arm build. Uh, we don't want that, so we're gonna drop this artifact. So see you later. Now we're gonna choose the correct one. So we're gonna get our QA artifact. That looks good. Um, and now we're gonna do something else because again, QA might be a shared environment. I might have other developers doing things that are leveraging my shared infrastructure. So um, we wanna make sure that before this gets moved in, it's not automated. We, we want some checks and balances. So I'm gonna do a pre-deployment uh, approval here. So I'm gonna say yes to that. Uh, I'll set myself as the approver. Otherwise, this would never get done. We'll set a timeout for how long this is gonna sit here before it eventually will go away. Um, you've got options like this, right? The re user requesting the release should not be the one to approve it. Um, so because you know I'm a one-man band, uh, we have to have that there, so we'll keep that going. Um, there's also uh, gates you can do. So we have pre and post uh, deployment approval gates. So I can do things like um, you know invoke a function. Maybe I want to check something uh, before I do this. There's lots of things we can do here. I can query a work item. Um, I can look for compliance states. I can look for alerts. Um, we don't need those. We'll just go with the, uh, uh, the approval process here. So that looks good. Um, and then other than that, we should be good to go because my ARM template step should all be referencing that variable. So this looks pretty good to me. So let's just go ahead and save that one now. Um, if we go back and look at our branches, we should see the new branch that I have, the fixed security branch, which we do. Um, and notice it's already saying, hey, would you like to create a pull request because there's this new branch out here. Um, let's take a look. So. First, we're gonna start triggering some of our CI CD now. Um, so let's go to our dev arm build and set it up for some automation. So triggers are at the top here. We're gonna go ahead and pick triggers. We're gonna say, yes, we wanna do some CI. Um, we don't want this run on the master branch. We don't want it run on the QA branch. We want it to run on all those feature branches. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do an exclude. So exclude master. If you do an exclude, you have to have an include. Um, we'll exclude QA. Um, we are gonna include though, asterisk. So everything except those things. So this will now build anytime um, anything is pushed not to QA or master. It will automatically build and will automatically deploy. So we're gonna do the same thing now in our pipelines. We're gonna go to the QA pipeline and we're gonna do something a little similar. Um, just to, for, for the sake of showing you this actually. Um, we don't want to necessarily do CI here, right? We want this to only be triggered by the pull request. So leaving this blank um, is actually what we want, right? I don't need to trigger this because my QA builds will be triggered by that build policy that we set on the QA branch. Okay, so let's do our first pull request. So I updated fixed security and technically it didn't go to dev because we didn't have our uh, CI set up, that's fine. We, we, we know this is gonna work. So we're gonna put this into QA first. Um, we haven't done our branch protection yet on Maps, so that's gonna be the last thing we do. So it's picking up my commit message. Um, obviously we can link work items and other things. If we had that, I can see the change down here. It was set to false, now it's set to true. That's exactly what I want. So I'm gonna go ahead and create my PR. Off we go. I am the approver, I am the completer, I am all these things, it's wonderful. It's good to be the king. So we'll say approve. I can also set autocomplete. Um, when I do autocomplete, what will happen is if it passes that build step that I have set, um, it'll go ahead and delete this branch, right? So that's fine. So we will set autocomplete. Um, my build is in progress. Off it goes. So this time when it runs our 
QA ARM build, um, this added HTTPS, it should pass um, the Azure security scan, which it's trying to right now. And then once that's done, we still haven't set up any CI, um, or CD, I'm sorry. So uh, let's look at our QA ARM release. We don't have a trigger set here. So let's set a trigger and hopefully we'll catch it in time. So my trigger here is this. When do I wanna do my continuous deployment? I wanna do it every time there's a new build available coming off of the QA ARM build artifact, right? So pull request, then um, uh, that triggers the build, the build builds the artifact, and then now anytime there's a new artifact, this is gonna trigger this uh, deployment. So if I caught that in time, uh, we should see that, and it looks like I did. So uh, once this is finished, we're gonna get now, um, we should see an email come to me that says, hey, you've got an approval step uh, out there waiting for you and uh, off we'll go. So this is the other reason I didn't put this into the, uh, the, the uh, you know, dev branch because it does take a little bit longer as it goes through and scans these things. Because these are hosted build agents, this is an important call out. If the software that's needed for your particular build is not on there, it downloads it, right? So if I have to specify import an import command uh, to pull in a module or something like that, it will actually go on and download it. There's a full list of what's out there that's installed on each different build agent that's hosted. Um, we install a lot of different stuff on there. Most of the times, all that stuff is already there. Um, but some of the, the slowness is it's downloading and installing, and then it's uh, running what I told it to. Okay, so if I look at my release, sure enough, notice it is sitting here, pending approval. I'm sure I have an email uh, in my inbox. We'll just go ahead and say approve though, that's fine. So I also have the option here to defer, right? So I can approve this now, but say, you know what? I don't want this change to go in until later tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and approve it, but I'm gonna wait, but that's fine. We don't wanna wait, we want it in right now. So off it's gonna go and we should see this get pushed into our uh, QA environment. Okay. Now let's do the granddaddy. We're gonna finally protect our master branch. So what do we have to do? Same process. We're gonna build a new pipeline, this time a build pipeline. We're gonna clone the QA one because we want that security step that's in there. So let's clone this pipeline. And same deal. We don't like that name. We want prod, PRD, I want my variables. PRD, okay, looks good. So we're gonna do something a little different here. Uh, so one of the other challenges with the infrastructure as code, no matter what you do on a, uh, a test plan, right? So any kind of custom unit testing you're doing, you know, uh, if you're using Terraform, right, the plan steps, if you're using what if deployments, the only way, in my opinion, to validate if infrastructure as code has actually worked is if it deploys. Right? Did the deployment actually succeed? Um, because without that, you just don't know. I mean, your plan steps could work just fine. You know, your templates could validate just fine. But then when they go and actually tries to build the resource, something happens, right? You know, maybe there's a quota limit. Maybe there's, again, a transient error. So the only way to validate is if it's a successful deployment is if it actually deploys into your environment. So we're going to actually test that. So Azure DevOps has a custom status API. We're going to set that as uh, an additional policy on our master branch. So we're going to look for both a successful build from this that we're building, and we're also going to look for a successful deployment. So the reason I had this set as Windows agent um, and named it that way is because we're going to add a different agent. So you can have multiple agents in the same uh, build job. So I'm going to add an agent job. And this time, though, I'm going to pick a Linux agent. And this is really just to show you how you can mix and match some of these things. There's no specific reason for using uh, Linux versus uh, uh, something else, right? So this is the agent pool, right? Um, you know, I don't want to inherit it uh, from a pipeline. Um, actually, I think I may have clicked on the wrong thing. What do I want? I don't want to. I want Azure pipelines. There we go. Agent specification. There we go. I want Ubuntu. Yes. Give me my Ubuntu agent. So how, now I have a Linux agent. We're going to actually push this up to the top too. Um, and if you had multiple um, build agents, we only have one, right? So mine all run uh, serially, right? So they don't run um, concurrently. Um, but if I had multiple builds, they would all go at the same time. Um, so now let's add a step. So this time we're going to add a bash step. We're going to do something in bash. 
So this is going to be, uh, let's see, capture PR ID. So we're gonna get the uh, pull request ID number. We'll just do this inline, and I'm gonna cheat because I do have a very simple uh, bash script here. Um, all this is doing is leveraging a built-in Azure DevOps variable. There's a full list of those out there. Um, but this one, system pull request dot pull request ID, that's one of those variables that's built into Azure DevOps. So I'm referencing that and I'm just outputting that to a file with the name of the artifact staging directory slash PR dot ID. And then I echo it so I can see it um, as output here. And, and then of course, we're gonna do our publish step because we do want to publish this out. And I'll answer the questions I see popping up um, at the end of this. I'm trying to work through it all. It's a, it's a lot we're doing here. And I'll be around after, so. Now we're gonna publish build artifacts. So this time will be our PR ID. And we have an artifact name. Yeah, I'm cheating here. We're using our same environment variable and we're gonna publish this particular path, which is our staging directory with slash PR dot ID. Okay, so now this is ready. Uh, running this won't actually get me the PR ID because this does have to be initiated with a pull request. So that system variable that we're capturing in bash only exists if a pull request has been issued. So this build step looks good. Now let's go check our release step. Uh, hopefully our uh, QA1 worked. Looks like it's, I forgot to hit the approve button or it's processing gates. Oh, you know what? I, uh, I set a deployment gate and didn't remove it. So I don't know if I can edit this in time. You can actually edit releases as they're happening. So if it was a later stage in the pipeline, which I only have this one, if it hadn't hit that stage yet, I'm able to actually edit the release as it's happening and uh, change the behavior. In this case, uh, I'm just gonna have to wait um, or I can cancel this, um, edit this specific release, which I will do. It's actually waiting five minutes, I think. So let's edit this release, edit these tasks. Uh, oops, sorry. We're going to go back here. Uh, we are going to say, I didn't see a gate enabled here. Maybe not. Okay. No worries. Here's what we'll do. We'll discard these changes. We'll edit the pipeline. And we'll check our gates. There they are. No gates enabled. We don't want that. We just want the pre-deployment approval. That's fine. And we'll just create a new release off of that last artifact. Release two. I have to approve it. Looks good. Off it goes. Okay, so now let's clone our pipeline. So we're going to go back up here. We're going to clone this one. This is our final step. And this is our PRD release. So variables first. We're going to go back to our pipeline. We're going to dump the QA variable. We don't want that artifact. We are gonna want the artifact from the prod build. That looks good. Latest version of that. Um, same thing, we're gonna set a trigger here. So every time a new build is available um, as part of that, we're gonna take it. Uh, we'll keep the deployment approvals and we're gonna add an additional step though at the end of this that does our successful validation. So everything else here looks good, um, but we're gonna add another pipeline step. So let's do this, let's add a step. We'll do an empty job again. So this one is gonna be um, post success. All right. We're gonna add a job. This time we're gonna use PowerShell so we can mix and match all these different things. Doesn't really matter, very flexible. We're gonna say post S-E-C-C-E-S-S. I'll do inline again. I'm going to copy my PowerShell script that I wrote earlier. Copy this. And I'll, I'll share all this, so don't worry if you know there's a lot going on here. You'll have full access to all this stuff. Um, this is just a very simple REST call. We're just using PowerShell to make the REST call. One thing that you'll note is we have in here this personal access token. So I have not defined that yet. So we do have to have access to post to that status API. Um, so with that, I will show you another way to link variables in. So we've been setting them manually in each pipeline step, but we also have the concept of a shared variable, which is what we call a library. So over here, I've got my library variables. I already set this one up. So there's a personal access token API 
The variable is named Pat. It's an encrypted value. Um, so you could generate access tokens uh, through Azure DevOps. You do it up here with security. You could set different uh, criteria for what level of access uh, those tokens need. So let's go back to our. Uh, hey, Eric. We, yep. We we do need to wrap it up so we can get the. Next oh man. On. Okay. Sorry. All right. Well, let me do the final thing then. Sorry. Let's go to branches real quick. Okay. We'll go branches. I'll show you this master branch. So branch policies, this is an important one. So the build policy, you've seen this step where we're going to do the prod arm build, but the other policy we want is down here, require from additional services. And here we're going to say, I want a custom policy of success, which is what that uh, PowerShell command will generate as the final step of that process. Um, and then the PR would succeed uh, going to, uh, to master. So apologies that I ran out of time. Um,